Hey guys, so how, what we've done so far is we've talked through the theory behind how we expect a minimum wage to affect employment, at the time, right, and, and at the market level. What we want to do now is think about how Card and Kruger go about trying to estimate the effect of minimum wages on employment. So overall, what we want to know, right, the empirical question we're trying to attack is the question of whether minimum wage increases cause declines in employment in the industries and establishments that pay the minimum wage. Right, in other words, are we gonna have the, the findings we expect from a neoclassical competitive labor market model, right, where as the minimum wage increases, it has to decrease employment, or are we gonna see evidence that we've got market power, right, where small minimum wage increases might increase employment, whereas larger minimum wage increases decrease. One thing to point out, one of the things that we've learned from the theoretical investigation we've done so far is that we shouldn't expect a minimum wage increase to have the same effect everywhere. Right, we're gonna expect that the, the effect of a minimum wage on employment is gonna depend on things like how big the minimum wage increase is, right? How much market power employers have, um, whether non-wage amenities are an important part of the and also the elasticity of demand, right, for, for um, low wage employees. Even if we're in a competitive model, we've got highly inelastic, very much of a decrease in employment. So in an ideal world, what we would do is we would look at the effect of many different minimum wage increases in an overall picture, right? That could give us a better sense of what to expect from any particular minimum wage increase. Okay. So if we're going to go about doing this, the obvious starting point, right? The, the, the first strategy we would want to consider is let's just do run a regression where we compare the minimum wages in various places to employment levels in those areas, right? So we could do something like say employment in state i of time t is going to equal beta naught beta one times the minimum wage i in time t. Right? And essentially, what this would tell us would we'll know are states that have high levels of minimum wages going to have higher or lower levels of employment than our states with low minimum wages. Right? And if we wanted to, we could specify, we could get a little bit more specific. Instead of looking at overall employment rates, we could look at something like teenage employment rates, right? The employment rates of the kind of workers who are most likely to be paid a minimum wage. Now, there's an obvious problem with doing this, right? Which is that in order to believe that this tells us the effect of a minimum wage on employment, we would need to believe that if not for that minimum wage difference, right? If, if, if everyone had the same minimum wage, there would be no differences in employment between the areas with high minimum wages and the areas with low minimum wages. But in fact, what we see is that areas with high minimum wage look a lot different than areas, look different in a lot of ways than areas with lower minimum wages, right? They're more likely to be coastal, they're more, li more likely to be controlled by the Democratic Party. They tend to have higher levels of unionization. And all this is going to because the employment, you know, the, the employment rate or the teenage employment rate is going to be affected by a lot of things other than the minimum wage, right? It's going to be affected by um, the returns to education in a particular area. The industrial mix of that area potentially going to be affected by welfare policies, right? And so these, these pre-existing differences between high and low minimum wage areas are potentially going to be really important. I'm going to show you that. I want to just show a map of what areas of the country have high and low minimum wages right now. What you can see is that, you know, areas on the west coast and the east and the northeast tend to have much higher minimum wages than do areas in, you know, the broadly defined southeast. So how can we improve on this strategy? Well, you know, what we've tended to do, right, is we've said, well, let's try to use a difference in difference approach, right? Instead of trying to argue that places with high minimum wages are otherwise the same as places with low minimum wages, let's argue that when an area increases its minimum wage, um, we can compare it to an area that didn't increase its minimum wage and say that if not for that minimum wage increase, they would have had the same changes in it. Right, so for example, if we wanted to look at the um, effect of a minimum wage increase in California, on employment in California, we could run something like employment IT, beta naught, beta one times California. Right, times beta three, California times I, post. We could run a regression like this, where essentially we would say, hey, let's compare the change in employment in California to, for example, the change in employment in Nevada over the same time period. 
right? And we would say that this difference in difference is going to estimate the effect of a minimum weight. Now, the problem with doing this, this is going to be an improvement, right? Because all we have to argue is that the changes in employment over time are the same in California and Nevada, if not for the minimum wage increase. But there's an issue with this as well, right? Because we generally expect that states aren't increasing their minimum wages at random. We would generally expect states to be more likely to increase their minimum wages during time periods when they expect employment growth to be good, right? It's going to be more politically feasible to increase the minimum wage when people are less worried about employment. And so as a result of that, we might expect that in general, areas that increase their minimum wages would have had faster employment growth than areas that didn't increase their minimum wages if the minimum wage had no effect whatsoever on employment, right? And if that's the case, this is going to be biased upward. Our rate of three is going to be biased upward, right? We're going to conclude that the minimum wage has a less negative effect or a more positive effect on, on employment than it actually did. So what Card and Kruger do is they look at one particular minimum wage increase where this is less of a concern. Specifically, they look at the increase in minimum wage that happened in New Jersey in 1990, $4.25 an hour to $5.05, so a pretty substantial minimum wage increase. The reason that this minimum wage increase is useful to look at is twofold. The most important thing is that while the minimum wage itself increased in 1992, the decision to increase the minimum wage was made back in 1990. And the reason that that's important is because in 1992, the U.S. economy was in a fairly deep recession, whereas in 1990, it was in an And so, essentially, the conditions under which the decision was made to increase the minimum wage were very different from the conditions under which the minimum wage actually happened. And we can be pretty confident that the New Jersey legislature didn't have increased the minimum wage in 1992 if they knew what the rate of growth looked like, because in the minimum wage increase, the only reason it went through is because the governor vetoed the bill that tried to stop the minimum wage increase from taking place. So as a result, we do a regression like this when we compare and look at New Jersey, right, instead of California. We're going to be a little bit less concerned that beta 3 is biased because of the fact that New Jersey didn't make the decision about whether to raise the minimum wage, knowing what was going to happen to their employment growth. The second advantage of looking at the New Jersey minimum wage increase is that New Jersey is a small state and it's part of a broader regional economy, right? The kind of broad mid-Atlantic New York area is all very heavily economically integrated, and there's really no part of New Jersey that isn't closely connected to the economy of Pennsylvania or the economy of New York. And so as a result, if we want to compare New Jersey and Pennsylvania, that's going to be more plausible, right? Pennsylvania is going to be more plausible as a control group for New Jersey than most states would be for other states, right? More plausible than using Nevada as a control group for California. Okay. On top of that, what Cardin Kruger do is they say, instead of looking at overall employment rates, let's look at employment in a set of businesses that we can really believe are similar in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And specifically, they're going to look at fast food franchises. The reason that this, has an, this is advantageous is twofold. So first of all, um, something like half of all the workers in the U.S. who earn minimum wage work in the restaurant industry. So this is a, a pretty important subset of minimum wage workers. But on top of that, fast food franchises are very, very homogeneous across state lines, right? If I'm in a Burger King in Pennsylvania, I likely have the same production technology, right? It takes the same number of people to make a burger. Um, the same cost of ingredients, the same, um, you know, basic structure of business as a Burger King in New Jersey. The only two things that are likely to be different in the Burger King in New Jersey versus the Burger King in Pennsylvania is going to be the availability of workers, right, the labor supply that I face, and the demand for my product, right, the price that I can charge for my, for my burgers or for my, my sandwiches. And so as a result, if we want to think about what our common trends assumption is, if we're comparing the same set of fast food franchises in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, all we really need to believe is that if not for the minimum wage increase, we would have had the same changes in labor supply in the two states before and after the minimum wage increase, and you would have had the same changes in product demand in, the, in these two states. So we're going to be able to abstract away from worrying about things like industry composition 
or um, labor law or all of these sorts of things that might be different from one state. Okay. So the first thing that they do to try to make the case for this common trend assumption, they say, let's look at how these fast food franchises looked in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania before the minimum wage increase. Right, of course, when we have a difference in different strategy, we don't need that New Jersey and Pennsylvania um, stores are identical before the minimum wage increase. We just need that they change in the same way. But the more similar they are before the minimum wage increase, the easier it is to believe that they would have been similar after the minimum wage. And if we look here, right, we're gonna see that overall they look pretty similar. You've got a similar distribution of stores um, across the four franchises that they look at. You know, you've got a similar percent full time, very, very similar starting wages. There's a couple of, there's just two differences that are worth pointing out. The first one is that on average, the New Jersey stores employed about three fewer workers than the Pennsylvania stores before the minimum wage increase. And the second is that the New Jersey stores were charging more for their meals, right, than their, for their burgers or sandwiches than were the Pennsylvania stores, charging about 10% more for a burger. Other than that, though, they look very, very similar across these dimensions that, the, that Card and Kruger look at. And if we look at the wage distribution, right, so we look at the fraction of these stores that were paying exactly the old minimum wage at 425, um, and so on and so forth, we're gonna see that New Jersey and Pennsylvania look pretty similar. So the, the dashed line here is Pennsylvania, the solid line is New Jersey. The main difference is gonna be that more Pennsylvania stores were paying high wages, right, wages of $5.05 an hour before the minimum wage increase than New Jersey stores. In contrast, after the minimum wage increase, um, New Jersey stores shifted their compensation a lot, right? Basically, every New Jersey store shifted to paying exactly the new minimum wage, whereas the Pennsylvania stores didn't change their compensation very much. The pattern in the, in the dash lines was very similar before and after. So what they're gonna do, right, the strategy that they're gonna use is gonna be a difference in difference estimation, just like the one we drew up here. However, they're gonna specify their regression a little bit differently than we've done in the past. In particular, instead of saying that an observation is an establishment in a particular year, what they're gonna do is they're gonna say each observation is a change in employment at the establishment level, right? So they're gonna say delta M. to be the change in employment. after the minimum wage increase, and an establishment I, right? And as a result, when they do this regression, they say delta M, I, sorry, I shouldn't have a T here, delta M, I is gonna equal Beta naught plus beta one times New Jersey. We're going to say that beta naught is going to be the average change in Pennsylvania establishments. Right? Beta naught plus beta one. change in New Jersey establishments and so beta 1 is the difference in difference right exactly for the same reasons that beta 3 is the difference in difference in our traditional regret okay now one other thing to point out when we're thinking about the strategy that they used, is that while this is their main strategy, right, comparing New Jersey to Pennsylvania, they use a second strategy to confirm their results. So what they do is they say, not only are we gonna compare New Jersey to Pennsylvania, New Jersey stores and Pennsylvania stores, let's also compare the New Jersey stores that had been paying at or above $5.05 an hour before the minimum wage increase, the ones that were paying low wages before the minimum wage. And the idea is essentially that if you were already complying with the new minimum wage, but you were already paying 505 or close to 505, the minimum wage increase shouldn't have affected you very much. But if you're one of these stores that was paying 425, 
the minimum wage is going to affect you. They're going to do this same sort of strategy, right? They'll say basically delta M. Beta one times gap. Gap is going to be essentially the difference between the new minimum wage and the wage that you were paying, right? And essentially what they're going to do here is they're going to say this beta one is going to capture the difference between the change in employment in high wage establishments, right? Establishments that were already complying with the law and the low wage establishments, the establishments that weren't already complying with the law. And the reason to do this, right? The reason to have this alternative control is because some of the things we might worry about when we're comparing New Jersey and Pennsylvania aren't going to be true when we compare high wage and low wage establishments in New Jersey, right? So for example, if we were worried that the recession hit um, Pennsylvania harder than it hit New Jersey, it's unlikely that it hit high wage fast food franchises differently than low wage fast food franchises in New Jersey. The only issue with this is the degree to which we believe this is going to depend on why it is that some establishments were paying higher wages than others. Right? If we thought, for example, that the New Jersey establishments that were paying higher wages were just in higher cost of living areas, maybe this would be fine. Right? But if we thought that they had a strategy of paying above market wages in order to attract better workers, they might have also been affected by the minimum. Okay, so that's it for talking through Carden Kruger's strategy. In the next video, we're going to go through their results, and then we're going to talk about how to interpret those.